Welcome to the Science of Success. Introducing your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet with more than 3 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we discuss a highly counterintuitive approach to learning that flies in the face of the way you think you should learn and how it might transform your learning process. We explore several powerful evidence-based learning strategies that you can start to apply right now in your life. We explain why you should focus on getting knowledge out of your brain instead of into it and what exactly that means. We share a number of powerful memory strategies that you can use to supercharge your brain and much more with our guest, Peter Brown. Do you need more time, time for work, time for thinking and reading, time for the people in your life, time to accomplish your goals? This was the number one problem our listeners outlined, and we created a new video guide that you can get completely for free when you sign up and join our email list. It's called How You Can Create Time for the Things That Really Matter in Life. You can get it completely for free when you sign up and join the email list at successpodcast.com. You're also going to get exclusive content that's only available to our email subscribers. We recently pre-released an episode and an interview to our email subscribers a week before it went live to our broader audience. And that had tremendous implications because there was a limited offer in there with only 50 available spots that got eaten up by the people who were on the email list first. With that same interview, we also offered an exclusive opportunity for people on our email list to engage one-on-one for over an hour with one of our guests in a live exclusive interview just for email subscribers. There's some amazing stuff that's available only to email subscribers that's only going on if you subscribe and sign up to the email list. You can do that by going to successpodcast.com and signing up right on the homepage. Or if you're driving around right now, if you're out and about and you're on the go, you don't have time, just text the word SMARTER to the number 44222. That's S-M-A-R-T-E-R to the number 44222. In our previous episode, we discussed the incredibly important thing that everyone, including you, gets wrong about presence. We explored how to prime yourself for the best performance in the moments of pressure and high-stakes situations where other people are watching and judging you. We looked at the results from thousands of experiments over the last few decades to uncover the fascinating truth about power and powerlessness. And we shared the exact strategy you can use to shift your brain into the mode that allows you to view the world as more friendly, helps you feel more creative, and makes you into someone who takes action. We dug deep into all of this and much more with our previous guest, Dr. Amy Cuddy. If you want to face the hardest moments of your life with a sense of power and confidence, Listen to that episode. Now for our interview with Peter. Peter is a best-selling author and novelist. He's the author of five books, including Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. Peter's work turns traditional learning techniques on their head and draws from recent discoveries in cognitive psychology to offer concrete techniques for becoming a more productive learner. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the American Public Radio, the New Yorker, and much more. Peter, welcome to The Science of Success. Hey, Matt, I'm really happy to be here with you. Thank you. Well, we're very excited to have you on the show. Obviously, I chose a great title for the book, being very similar to the title of the podcast. But as somebody who's a novelist, I'm really curious how you came to write a book about the applications of cognitive psychology to learning. (laughs) Yeah, it seems like an odd choice, but I've always been a guy who's interested in learning new things. And I was between writing projects and meeting with my brother-in-law, his name is Roddy Rodiger, Henry Rodiger. He's an internationally acclaimed cognitive psychologist at Washington University in St. Louis. And he was getting at the end of 10 years leading a group of his colleagues at different universities in a series of empirical studies into what teaching and learning strategies lead to better retention of the new material. Roddy's field is memory. And he was telling me that what they had found over this decade of research, which of course is built on prior research and so forth, was non-intuitive. It it suggests that most of us go about learning in the wrong way if we follow our intuition. And he just caught my attention. And he said, we're trying to figure out how to get this research out to a broad audience. And so we decided to collaborate. 
The third author is one of his colleagues, another cognitive psychologist at Washington University in St. Louis, Mark McDaniel. And the three of us set out to capture the findings from this large body of scientific research in a form that was highly anecdotal and engaging so we could get it to a broad public audience. So that's how I got into it. And I think Jerry Jeff Walker once said, there's some driveways in life you just have to back out of with your lights off. I wasn't sure when I got into this, writing the science book, if this might be one of those driveways for me, but actually it turned out well. So that's how I got into it. I had to learn the science well enough to be able to elaborate on it, describe it, and so forth. So it was a great opportunity for me both to learn about learning and to uh, actually experience it again in tackling something unfamiliar. So let's begin with the two or three biggest ideas that came out of that learning, and then we'll dive into each of those and do a little bit more deep digging. Yeah, that's a great idea. But most of us intuitively think that learning is about getting knowledge and skills into the brain. And if you want learning to stick, really, the challenge is practice at getting learning out of the brain. When you encounter something new, it takes hours or days for that new knowledge to move into your brain and get consolidated into long-term memory. And that uh, process, if you could cause that to consolidation to happen from time to time, it really pulls forward the most important information and connects it to what you already know. So this, the act of wrestling with the material by trying to explain to someone else, retrieving it from memory, that's what builds learning that sticks. So the big idea, number one, is about getting it out and not about getting it in. And correspondingly, a second really big idea in this book is that we want to try to make learning easy. We want to make material very clear, easy to understand. Uh, but it turns out that uh, when learning is easy, it doesn't stick. And you think it will because it seems obvious. But there are some kinds of difficulties that feel like they slow it down uh, and you feel like I'm not getting it, but they cause you to wrestle with the material in ways that actually strengthen its connections to what you know and deepens your grasp of it and makes it stick. So that's a second big idea that some kinds of difficulties are desirable, not all kinds, but some kinds, and I could talk more about that. For me, you know, at the end of, a, of several years of working through this, the third big idea for me is that intuition leads us astray. When we go to the golf course and try to hone our 20-foot putt, we hit that 20-foot putt over and over until we feel like we've got, got it. You know, we made it stick. When we're reading a chapter and preparing for an exam, we reread that and over and over and memorize the phrases and so forth, even if we do well on, a, on an exam shortly after. In both of those examples, the learning doesn't stick. It builds on short-term memory. In the case of golf the golf course, it hasn't been consolidated, but your intuition says, I've got it, and when I come back, I'm going to be able to do well. Whereas if you mix up your 20-foot putt with other strokes and then have to come back and try it again and recall from memory what was it about this 20-foot putt, that effort, your performance is kind of clunky, and you walk off the course thinking maybe you're not getting it. But when you come back, actually, you have more improvement because that kind of retrieval practice and mixing up of practice has caused the learning to be consolidated better. Uh, so you cannot just rely on what feels uh, constructive. If you're either in athletics or any motor skills or in semantic learning, the kind that we do in classrooms. And that's a problem because students often end up, or any learner often ends up with faulty uh, judgment of what they know and can do. So the upshot of that idea is, is this notion that oftentimes what feels like we're learning the most can actually be sort of sabotaging our learning or that we're, we're not learning as much. And yet when we often feel like we're not learning because it's challenging or difficult or we're doing lots of things at once, we may actually be building richer and better memories. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. And uh, anybody who spent a length of time in a foreign country struggling to master a language they're not familiar with in various settings and getting that sort of panicky feeling and embarrassment 
ultimately will find themselves in an unexpected situation where they're speaking rather fluently. They're maybe using some idioms they didn't even know they knew because of this ragged, patchy, difficult way of wrestling with the problem. And the, one of the great things about being a human being is the brain is wired to wrestle with this stuff once you've engaged it in the problem. So when you attempt something this difficult, your brain will continue to work on that problem while you sleep. The big issue is to engage in it in a way that's mentally rigorous and then to give your brain some time to work on it and come back to it at another time. And, and that's, uh, it's not intuitive, but it is highly effective. So before we dig into each of these buckets a little bit more, I want to understand how memory is created and stored. Can you tell me a little bit about that process, how it goes from short-term memory to long-term memory and how the hippocampus gets involved and how our lack of understanding of that can often confuse what we think is effective learning and from what really is. Right. Yeah. So the hippocampus is the portion of the brain where memory is formed, but it's stored in various parts of the brain, depending on whether it's a motor skill or semantic learning. The actual physiology is something that neuroscience is helping us understand right now. I mean, there's a tremendous amount yet to be learned. The cognitive psychologists know from the evidence of the studies, if you do this, the following things will happen. How it happens in the brain, we're still learning. But it seems to be like this, that you encounter some new knowledge or skill. The experience of it is laid into your hippocampus and what's called uh, traces, memory traces. Uh, the brain tries to make sense of those traces. So it, it fills out gaps, tries to figure out how it connects to what you already know. Any new learning can't be learned if you can't connect it to something you already know. So that's part of this process of, of rehearsal that goes on in the brain with new information and the movement and connection of that into other parts of the brain. Now, memory has a, a couple of components. One component is the knowledge or skill is connected through your neurons to other pieces of knowledge that you have. And the more connections you can make to current knowledge, the more thoroughly embedded the new skill or knowledge will be in your brain. But there's another aspect to memory, and that is your ability to find it later when you want to recall it. There's many things that have happened to you in your past or addresses you've lived at or phone numbers you've had that you can't bring up quickly. But uh, given the right prompt, some of these things will come to the fore in your mind. That's the fact of the memory still being in there, but the retrieval cues not being there. So in, when we're learning something new, what we're trying to do is engage with the material enough so that this help the brain figure out what are the key ideas and go through, give it time overnight, uh, over days to consolidate and, and get connected to other stuff, elaborate on it, uh, how is this like, what I already know, and so forth. And then to try to connect it as broadly to current knowledge and associate with it other vivid memory cues. They might be visual cues. There's times perhaps when you've been talking with a friend and you wanted to remark on something you heard from another friend and you're trying to place where it was, who was that? And then you'll see it was in a such and such a restaurant and boom, that visual of being at that table in the corner brings back, oh, that was Larry who told me this and Larry such and such, so he's kind of an authority. Anyway, if you get my drift there, it's the idea of attaching to new learning uh, the kinds of cues that will help bring it forward later. You know, that reminds me of one of my favorite quotes about learning and memory, which is the more you know, the more you can know, right? There's this idea that our, our brains don't get full of knowledge. And in fact, the more information you have, the more relevant connections you can, you can connect different pieces of information and actually make recall easier, make it easier to understand and plug into existing frameworks and mental models that you have for understanding other spheres of influence and knowledge. Well, you have that exactly right, Matt. And I mean, you can think of it in your own life, you know, building with Lego blocks or playing Scrabble or, you know, getting involved in a new uh, sport, biking and learning how to uh, fix your bike. The more you know, the more you can add to that knowledge. One of the great things about complex, sophisticated knowledge is you begin to construct these mental models, which 
you become almost unaware of. For example, when you start out learning to drive a car, you have to learn about adjusting the mirrors. You have to learn about adjusting the seat and your seat belt, of course, and how you start it and what, where you look when you pull away and signaling your turns, all that kind of stuff. Actually, it's a very complex uh, set of things you have to remember to do, but after a while, you never give it another thought. You hop in the car, you do those things, off you go, your mind's on where you're going and what you're going to do when you get there. That's a mental model. That driving is a mental model. Now, if you land in another country where they drive on the other side of the road, you suddenly become aware again of all these things that you're doing without thinking about them that have to be done differently. So the idea here is, as you say, building these mental models, adding more knowledge to them, understanding how they relate, it opens the world to other learning. You also touched on visual and spatial memory and how that can help enrich our memories and make things more memorable. I've done a lot of work and, and research around that area personally and implemented some of those strategies in my life. I'm curious if if in your work you came across things like memory palaces, mind maps, visual markers, any of these strategies and what, what you uncovered or discovered about them. Yes. My co-author, uh, Roddy Rodiger, actually heads up a competition among super uh, memory athletes and which uh, has been sponsored by a pharmaceutical company doing research into memory and there is in the book make it stick a chapter that talks a lot about these mnemonic devices the main idea here is that a mnemonic advice a simple mnemonic device is uh, for memorizing the great lakes is homes h-o-m-e-s so it gives you Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and, and Superior. An even better one, uh, I learned from a friend in Australia. He was taught as a child uh, how to know the North American Great Lakes in geographical order from east to west. Old elephants have musty skin. <laughs> well, those, the idea is it's, it's a way of organizing what you already know. So mnemonic devices can be very sophisticated, very complicated, but they are ways of helping you remember a grocery list or uh, in the case of the competitions that Karate does, you can uh, memorize a random deck of cards in something like 30 seconds. I mean, it's just astonishing how these tools can be used, but they're not about learning. They're about organizing what you learn and being able to uh, draw it up again later. Memory Palace is a great example. Memory Palace, which you bring up, is something that's a a useful tool. I wrote about that in the book regard to a a psychology professor in in England who was helping his students prepare for their A-levels and how the students would go to a a cafe and uh, sit there and say, okay, on this particular topic, I might have to write about on my A-levels. Here are the big ideas. I'm going to pretend if that topic comes up, that I come to this front door and I go through this cafe in the following sequence. And the big plant in the front door is going to be associated with this idea. And they built, develop these associations so that when they sit down with a test, not knowing which of these things they're going to have to write, when one pops out, they know, well, that takes me over to you know, the such and such cafe. And I walk in that door. These are the things. So it helps reduce the anxiety about being able to recall it later and give you a a way, sort of a metal filing cabinet for it. Very successful. I think that's a great distinction, which is this idea that it's not necessarily a learning strategy, but rather a way to organize knowledge that can be really effective. So let's come back to some of these big ideas. And and I want to start with a simple notion that you you talk about in the book and you've spoken about this idea that the way we think we should learn and and the classic example of a college student reading the textbook, taking notes. When you're studying for the exam, you pull out your notes and you reread them and you study them over and over again. In many cases, that's a really flawed strategy. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about why that is. There's a couple of reasons. One, when you read a text, unless you put it aside and ask yourself, what were the big ideas in this text? How would I winnow this down? How does this connect to what I already know? Let's just say you read it and you you try to remember it and you read it again. You underline lots of passages. You highlight passages. You've taken down verbatim notes from the lecture and you spend a lot of time rereading that material before you go in uh, to the test. You haven't really digested it and winded it down to the main ideas and put them in your own words and explain them to yourself 
how these things relate to what you already know and so that you can draw them up in an exam and apply them, if you will. So the most in surveys of college students, rereading is far and away the most common study strategy. Far better is to read it a couple of times and then put it aside and quiz yourself on it and then go back and check, see whether you got it or not, and then put it aside and come back to it another day and say, can I still recall this stuff? And that act of retrieving it from memory after you've gotten really rusty with it, but before you've forgotten it completely, has a very strong effect of strengthening the retention because you know the learning becomes plastic again in your mind, if you will. The mind reconsolidates it, saying these are the key ideas, this is how they connect to what I already know, and you've got it much better then. So this notion of focusing on rereading, underlining, highlighting, rereading, you spend a lot of time and you sweat a lot, and you think you've really done your homework, but you haven't done yourself much in the way of a favor come exam time. Now, it's true, if you pull an all-nighter, you can do probably pretty well the next morning on a test, but there's some really powerful research showing that a week later, you have lost most of what you had that morning after an all-nighter, whereas those who had studied by quizzing themselves have retained most of it. And so uh, this comes into the next kind of key point that you made is this idea, when you say that learning is about not getting knowledge in your head, but rather getting it out of your head, that might confuse listeners or, or, or make people kind of turn their heads. What do you mean when you say that? And how do we think about applying that to our lives? Sure, you've got to be exposed to the new material. You've got to read the text, hear the lecture, go out on the course and try Try, try whatever it is you're doing and maybe have a coach or whatever you're trying to learn. Sit in front of the computer with your computer game and give it a shot. But if you want that learning t- to stick and you want to be able to build on it, then the real trick there is to do the things I've described here of trying to identify what were the big ideas, put them in your own words, and practice retrieving them later. So there's several strategies that are very potent from this research for learning. One is you do as I just said. You try to put in your own words what it is you learned and relate it to what you already know. The second thing is that is very effective is to space out over time your learning of a, of a skill or a subject. So you're not trying to do this thing this week and that thing the next week and another thing the third week. You want to start the third week stuff right up in week number one with the other things, get an exposure to it, try to learn some of it, and come back to it again later. Spacing out learning is very powerful for helping connect various things you're learning to each other and for challenging your brain to come back to something that you've engaged in a little earlier because of that the benefits of that retrieval of that self-testing or flashcards, what have you, whatever it is, it helps you try to come back to something earlier. So retrieval practice, spacing it out. Another difficulty that's desirable is to mix up your practice. So if you're trying to learn to find the volume of uh, several geometric solids, uh, and you spend, you know, you solve eight or 15, the volume of eight or 15 spheres, and then you do eight or 15 wedges, and do eight or 15 cones. You do very well in your practice because you've learned the formula and you've practiced applying it. And during the, the learning phase, you do extremely well. If you're tested on that a week later, you don't do nearly as well as you did during the learning phase because the problems are thrown at you at random order, and you have to figure out which formula goes with which problem and then apply the formula. Whereas if when you're learning it, you learn each of those three formulas, and then you take your practice problems and you put them in a bag and shake it up, and you draw them out at random, your performance during that learning phase, during that practice, will be more ragged. You won't feel like you're getting it as well. But come the test uh, a week later, you're going to be far better. You're going to do far better at identifying the right formula for the problem that gets presented at random and applying it successfully. So this notion of interleaving or mixing up the problems during practice, again, is one that it's a difficulty 
an added difficulty that does it feels counterproductive because I don't see my performance being that impressive, but the benefits are potent. I'd love to dig a little bit more into this idea of spaced repetition. That's another thing that I've encountered in doing a lot of homework and studying around effective learning strategies. Even have you come across or seen a forgetting curve and this kind of idea that you should? <laughs> yes, the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve comes from the, the late 19th century, which shows that when you're exposed to something new very, very quickly, you will lose about 70% of it. And then the last 30%, you forget more gradually, but you forget it. It's the human condition. Forgetting is the human condition. That's why you've got to find a way to interrupt the forgetting. And this idea of retrieving from memory, is that's the way to tie the knot, to keep that memory. It's anything you want to be able to recall later, periodically, has to be recalled from memory in order to make it stick. And from the research I've seen around forgetting curves, it's this idea that there's actually a pattern of the first time you learn something, if you review it, you know, these might not be exact, but you review it a day later, and then you review it three days later, and then you review it a week later, and then you review it a month later. And the idea is that over a certain curve of space repetition, you can essentially retain fully whatever knowledge you've learned as long as you review it at the right increasingly lengthy intervals. Yeah. So that's a great point, Matt. There was a guy named Leitner, I think a German, who invented a little box for the flashcards. And uh, the first uh, part of the box are all the cards you don't know very well. But when you've answered it correctly, you should keep mixing them up. Uh, and when you've answered one correctly a couple of times, you put it in the second box, which is maybe I'm only going to practice that every third day. And when those do well, you put it in the uh, next uh, box, which is maybe you're going to practice that every two weeks. So this notion of when you're on top of it, when you can retrieve it, let some time go by. Let yourself get a little rusty, but don't ever stop retrieving it every so often in order to keep it fresh. Earlier, you touched on an analogy that I think is a really important way to illustrate this from the book, which is you, you kind of subtly said, tie the knot on your knowledge. And you, you use an example of a string of cranberries. I'd love to just share that analogy with the listeners so they can understand the importance of pursuing the right strategies when it comes to learning and, and really truly retaining knowledge. Uh, thanks. I like that one. I don't know exactly how that came to me. The, the mysteries of the mind when you start wrestling with something and the mind starts making connections to other experiences in your life that might be relevant. It's one of the gifts of, of metaphor that writers experience. And in this particular case, I thought of, for some reason, of a child putting cranberries on a thread and uh, going to hang them on the tree and discovering they were falling off the other end of the thread because there was no knot. And if every cranberry is some kind of learning that you want to make sure you hang on to, it's like a string of pearls. You need to knot every one of them. You need to practice each of those periodically to make sure it stays there. And I think I wrote that we're all losing our cranberries <laughs> eventually. But if it's important to you, you need to continue to uh, you know, put in another knot there behind that thing that you want to hang on to. I'm so excited to tell you about our sponsor for this holiday season, the incredible organization, The Life You Can Save. I'm sure you get overwhelmed by the countless giving opportunities out there. You feel confused, frustrated, and unsure about what the best thing to do is. When that happens, you often end up making scattered donations to a smattering of random charities with no idea of the real impact you're creating on people's lives. That's why I love the life you can save. You know the focus of the science of success is on being evidence-based. The beautiful thing about the life you can save is that they focus on evidence-based giving, finding, selecting, and curating the most high-impact donation opportunities so that you don't have to do all that hard work. And you can start giving right now by visiting www.thelife you can save.org slash success. That's the life you can save.org slash success. They've already done the homework and they have an incredible, well curated, compelling list of hugely impactful giving opportunities where your donation will be high leverage and cost effective. Our hearts, relationships, and networks often guide our giving. The resulting donations usually do some good, but rarely as much as we'd like them to do. The life you can save makes it so that you 
can easily navigate how to make your charitable giving go much, much further. While you may not be as wealthy or successful as Bill Gates, yet, you can still have an enormous impact on the lives of people living in extreme poverty that can experience dramatic improvements in their lives for much smaller donations. Visit thelifeyoucansave.org slash success to find out more and make rational, evidence-based charitable gifts this holiday season. You also shared and touched on earlier this example of, of practicing a golf putt, let's say 20 times in a row or for an hour or two. How does that tie into this notion, this big idea you talked about before of mixed practice and versus what we sort of traditionally look at as you call it mass practice? Yeah. So there's massed and blocked. Mass practice is this notion where you would keep hitting that putt over and over again. And you do get better. You see the evidence of your improvement. Uh, and that improvement leans on your short-term memory, as I, as I had said. So what you really want to do is practice it a couple of times and then do some other putts or do some other golf strokes and come back to it later. This idea of, of retrieving it and trying to, if you will, download from your memory what you did earlier is a very uh, powerful way of reactivating this consolidation process. I was chatting with a friend of mine while I was working on this book about this idea of mixing up your practice. And he said, oh, we do that in basketball all the time. He's a basketball coach. He said, well, we, have, we run these drills all around the basketball court. And you go over here and you do this and you go over there and you do that and so forth and so on. So we get it all mixed up. So I was chatting with my co-authors about this and they're saying, well, that's like the old LP album. And when you heard this song, you knew exactly what was coming up next. It really wasn't mixed up. It was, you knew at each juncture what you were expected to do next. Mixing it up would be, randomly on the court which move you you do which play you make so the golf putt the football plays the uh, solid geometry the language lesson all of those will uh, come to inhabit your mind and be connected broadly in your mind when you encounter them from a new angle or somewhat unexpectedly what the scientists call transfer of a, of a skill from one setting to another setting is greatly improved when the practice involves uh, mixed challenges, the interleaving of different problems, new situations. It's like putting a pilot in a flight simulator and throwing some kind of emergency at the pilot and the pilot having to recall quickly what the proper steps are even before you get out your flight manual uh, just to stabilize the aircraft. So this notion is really one of challenging yourself to perform the maneuver or deliver the knowledge or explain it in a situation that's a little different each time that makes you much more versatile in your mastery of that information and it broadens its connection to the other things you know and can do so it's easier to find again later because it's been associated in different contexts with other kinds of knowledge and in the book you talk about how this idea of mixed practice can apply both to physical sort of motor skills and also to semantic knowledge as well right it's yes exactly the research seems to run parallel it's pretty exciting one of the things well, there's this one study I particularly liked. It involved grade school children tossing bean bags into baskets. And I think it was for over 12 weeks in gym class. And some of the kids tossed their bean bag into four foot baskets every time. And other students tossed into either a three foot or a five foot, depending on what they were asked to do, but they never tossed into the four-foot basket. And at the end of the 12 weeks, when they were all tested tossing into a four-foot basket, the kids who did best were the ones who hadn't tossed into the four-foot basket, but they tossed into the three and the five-foot baskets. And the theory is that they developed a more sophisticated ability to judge distance and, and respond accordingly, and that that more complex motor skill this, again, is, is a theory about explaining this, is uh, encoded in a part of the brain where more complicated motor skills are uh, stored. 
versus the simplistic repetitive movement in against one target. I've even heard this idea applied from kind of a bigger picture perspective that instead of reading one book at a time, it you it actually can behoove you to read multiple books at once so that you have all kinds of rich different context and examples and knowledge that can help you form deeper and richer memories. <laughs> I'll say in my experience writing an historical novel, that was definitely the case because I could read things from the period, from different points of view. I could begin to hear my characters talking about the, the news of the day. I began to understand where the places, how they places and the events of the time interconnected. I would say, I don't know of any research that would say you should mix up your reading of your mathematics with the philosophy with something else. And I can't say it's good or bad. I would say my intuition tells me you need to be able to hang on to the thread of each of those books so that when you come back to it, you can maybe don't have this problem. I do often. I've got a book. I've got several books on my nightstand. I pick one up and I see that I'm between chapters. I'm right in the middle of something. I'm thinking, well, what was going on before this page? And I have to back up a couple pages to recapture the thread. I think that's an important thing if you're mixing up your reading that you don't go to the point where you lose the thread or lose the plot, as they say. You want to be able to hang on to it then the mixing up might be beneficial. But I can't say that that I've seen any studies on that. How does this notion of mixed practice interact with some of the research around the dangers of multitasking or the cost of task switching and the cognitive penalties that you suffer from switching between different activities? Well, that's just a really great question. In multitasking, the notion is that you've got uh, it's like a juggler with several balls in the air and you're keeping track of all of them at one time. That's taking your working memory. We we're all ha are limited in how much working memory uh, we have at any given moment. It's why the telephone numbering system is seven numbers. I mean, uh, it was originally seven numbers before we had area codes because that's about what you can hold in memory, working memory long enough to go from the phone book to the phone and dial it up or going to the grocery store. You can remember a certain number of things, and if you use some kind of a mnemonic, you can probably remember a few more, but there's a limit to it. So multitasking is not supported by the research as an effective way to study or learn if it saps you, your focus, your ability to focus on the problem at hand. So when I talk about interleaving and mixing up and that sort of thing, I'm saying you're going to focus on this now, then you're going to focus on this other thing, and then you're going to focus, you're going to come back to this again later, and you're dedicating your working memory to that particular task, but you come back to it after having dedicated your working memory to something else. And when you come back to this one that you'd looked at earlier, you have to say, oh, okay, now, what was that? How do I come back to that? Does that make sense to you and the difference there? Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. So the idea is basically that in order to almost merge these two ideas that may seem conflicting, the notion is you dedicate your whole working memory to one task, but you want to be juggling or switching those tasks relatively frequently to generate the benefits of enhanced learning and mixed practice. Right. And the point of, of moving on isn't really leaving this. That's not the point. The point is that you... is. Coming back to it is after having focused on something else, because when you come back, that's when you have to ask yourself, where was I? What, what is this? How do I do this? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's this great study in the medical profession where the doctors were learning to tie tiny little well, microsurgical knots to repair uh, vessels. And the typical way that doctors learn this, they go away for a Saturday and they see a video about how to do this microsurgery and then they're given a something called a Penrose drain. There's a little rubber tube that's often used to drain surgical sutures after a surgery and they, they're supposed to tie together two pieces of this rubber and then they're given another video and then some uh, synthetic tissue and they try to do the same thing and then there's a third video and they're given a turkey thigh and they repair some tiny vessels. And so the idea is there's four videos, four practice sessions, one day, boom, you've got it. You're now a microsurgery uh, expert. That's the typical way it's done. Well, in this study, half of the docs did it that way. And half of the docs did all the four same four steps, but there was a week between each one. So they went in the first week, they saw the video, they got the, the Penrose drain, they did the repair, they went back to their office to do something else. A week later, they came back for the second video and the synthetic tissue. 
Well, I can imagine. They go back the second week and they're thinking, eh, what was that last week? You know, I can imagine their pulses were raised a little bit, tried to recall it because they only had that little bit of exposure. So they did the second one, went away for a week, came back, did the third and so on. A month after completion of the training, in each case, they were tested on, on expert measures, expert uh, microsurgical instructors who would watch them do, do this stuff and how well they did. And then, as a surprise, they were each given a rat that needed to have the aorta reattached, a live rat. And in all the expert measures and in the surgeries, the doctors who had had exactly the same training, but it was spaced out week by week, over four weeks, did far better than the other doctors. And that's simply the fact of uh, letting your brain wrestle with it, coming back, that added effort of remembering and then building on that remembering with another effort and going away. It is a desirable difficulty, that spaced kind of practice and mixed up with the other things they spent their, their time doing in the intervening week. Did you come across the term uh, creative incubation at all in your research around this phenomenon? I'm not familiar with the term, no. So it's basically this idea that it's the similar notion applied to creativity, which is basically the idea of feed information into your subconscious, then step away from the problem for an hour or, you know, a week or several days and then come back to it. And you'll often generate kind of new breakthrough insights. But it's very... Oh, man. Yeah, I believe in that big time as a writer. I'm married. My wife likes to let's get out first thing in the morning. Otherwise, we're not going to get our exercise in. Well, you go ahead. (laughs) I find if I'm working on something difficult, writing something, I'm much better off struggling with that until, I don't know, 10.30 in the morning or 2.30 in the afternoon. And then I get on my bike and go like hell because my mind is just wrapped up in the stuff. And when I get on the bike and I push up the hills and, and cruise along and think about something else, oh, I get these ideas, I get these breakthrough thoughts. And I think it's what you're describing, what you call creative incubation is, it, to me, I'm, I've primed my brain and then I've let my body go, you know, and I start getting back this incredible stuff. It's fascinating. I think the common thread between these two notions is that you input knowledge in your brain and then by consciously doing something else, you're allowing the subconscious to recombine, to look at new alternatives, to process and and, and store the knowledge. And it seems like whether it's the context of learning or creativity, the same notion is really powerful. Oh, I think it is. I think this is what the brain does best. When we get nervous about whether it's working is when we get in our own way. <laughs> it's better when we just really push for the challenge and then go on and do something else and let it alone and come back to it later. So you, I want to, that, that brings up a point that I want to come back to, which is the idea of embracing difficulty and how mental effort is really important for encoding and retrieval of information. Yeah, there's this, Eric Kandel is a neuroscientist Nobel laureate who's uh, really trying to understand the biology of memory. And there's this really wonderful video, which is available on Nova, if you go online. If you Google Nova Candel, K-A-N-D-E-L, in (laughs) C-slug, you maybe put the word memory in there, you'll probably find it. What he he discovered that C-slugs have uh, few but very large neurons in their brains and that he demonstrates that well, one thing about sea slugs is if you uh, touch a sea slug uh, siphon with a stimulus uh, it'll close down it's like if you're at the sea and you you touch a, oh, I can't even think of the sea animals but when you touch them you see them closing up and then they open up again when you go away and this is true of the sea slug siphon as well but if you have just a tiny little electric current in that probe it closes and stays closed much longer. So he demonstrates how he creates a memory in the sea slug in the neuron between a regular uh, touch with a probe, which is a short closure, versus a one that has a slight current in it, which is much longer closure. And the sea slug remembers that long closure. And then he shows you with a video on, on a slide, the neurons reaching out to form a connection with other neurons, which is the physiological aspect of memory. Memory is physiological, actual physical changes in the brain. This is what's so compelling to me about this this video of candles. And if you think of learning that way, 
it helps them to understand why this why it's true that mental effort and persistence toward a learning goal if it feels difficult well you're actually changing your brain you're actually creating new connections and new synapses so yeah it is difficult if you interpret the difficulty as i i'm not getting it i don't have what it takes and that's too bad because you could say i'm not getting it yet dr carol dweck uh, who's well known for this theory of the growth mindset has shown that if you understand that your intellectual abilities aren't just fixed by the gift of your genes but uh, to a large extent can be increased by building these connections in the brain by building mental models and increasing your knowledge you are actually increasing the wiring in your brain then it's worth persevering and if one strategy to learn something doesn't work you try a little different strategy but you carry on forward you don't interpret the difficulty as failure you interpret it as knowledge and as the kind of effort that's involved in doing the important work of of mastering whatever it is you're after so for listeners who want to concretely implement some of the themes and ideas that we've talked about today what would be one piece of homework that you would give them to really take action on these ideas well i think that you kind of stumped me there matt i mean make it stick the science of successful learning by harvard university press would be a great way to start where it's where we've taken all this research and laid it out with examples and a, a reader friendly explanation i would say one of the things to do is to look back in your own life the things that you've tackled maybe for fun that were a struggle where you surprised yourself at actually discovering you became good at it i mean i don't know whether it's riding a bike or what what it is but we all from the moment we got off off the all fours and started walking have had these experiences of trial and error leading to success so one thing to do is is to inquire of your own life where you have had these challenges and been surprised at your success in learning something using strategies that felt ragged and slightly random rather than you know this kind of idea of mass or block practice uh, the other thing is to read the science of learning there's some great stuff on the web there's some really fantastic books that are coming out that take these fundamental discoveries about learning and animate them Uh, through stories and examples and one other thing that's also available broadly available are new tools to create flashcard sets or quizzes that will come into your phone on something where you're trying to memorize stuff this is big in medical school but in many different fields there's quizlet there's anki there's others there's many different now slide decks or what have you that you can use to begin to test yourself that's the fundamental issue uh, is to practice retrieving practice performing and space it out mix it up practice doing it and only by doing it whatever it is answering the flash card or or pedaling the bike uh, only by doing that can you really be confident that you know how to do it not by reading about riding the bike or reading the flash cards or what have you it's by self testing and spacing that out and coming back to it again later and aha i do know it and we'll make sure to include a lot of these resources in the show notes anki is a personal one that i love and use it's a free piece of software that you can use to space out and it actually bakes in these forgetting curves as well but peter where can listeners they want to do some more homework they want to find you they want to find your work what's the best place for them to do that online well make it stick.com is the website the website has got a fair amount of information on it there are a couple others that i would mention there's one called retrievalpractice.org which is and and another one called learning scientists that's plural scientists learning scientists.org those are geared mostly to teachers and mostly in the K12 range or uh, post secondary those are great sources but there's a lot of stuff out there and we have some links at makeitstick.com as well and if people want to be in touch by email our email address is there it's authors at makeitstick.net we didn't own .com for a while now we do but either one works authors at makeitstick.net 
is an email address. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show, for sharing all this knowledge and wisdom with listeners. I'm a huge fan of many of these learning strategies that you've shared, and I think it was a great conversation. Matt, I loved it. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created this show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success.